I want you to go with me um, to Ecclesiastes. We're going to read something then. I'm going to ask you just to close your eyes with me again. Ecclesiastes chapter 9. Ecclesiastes chapter 9. I want you to read with me there from verse 2, but I'm going to start... Well, let's start from verse 2. You'll get the gist. Ecclesiastes chapter 9 from verse 2. Okay. All share a common destiny. The righteous and the wicked, the good and the bad, the clean and the unclean, those who offer sacrifices and those who do not. As it is with the good man, so with the sinner. As it is with those who take oaths, so with those who are afraid to take them. This is the evil in everything that happens under the sun. The same destiny overtakes all. May God bless this word as we study it today. I want you to close your eyes with me. Our gracious Father in heaven, it is such a privilege for us to find ourselves in the presence of your word. And we are asking that as we study your word, that that spirit that you gave to us to guide us will guide us. And that we will learn a very important lesson that we need to learn today. That when we leave this place, we may not be disillusioned or also misled or misinformed but that we may know that we have sat down and heard the words of truth. And as Brother Ethel did indicate, gracious Father, your truth does sanctify us, and your truth sets us free. We are bound in all kinds of myths and concepts that are given by the world, superstitious words, but may your, your word today set us free from those bonds that hold us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. When you read 1 Kings and 2 Kings, it's quite sad, and I'd like you to do this with me just as a matter of introduction. Go with me, say for example, to 1 King chapter 15. 1 King chapter 15. I want you to listen to these words, okay? And I'm going to ask you a question after each one. 1 Kings chapter 15 verse 1. It says, in the 18th year of his reign of Jeroboam, son of Nebat. Okay, do you have that? Everybody see that? Who are we talking about? Verse 3. He committed all the sins his father had done before him. His heart was not fully devoted to the Lord his God, as the heart of David his forefather had been. Do you have that? We see quite clearly that he, as it says there, committed the sins. Okay, then I want you to notice that it ends with the concept that he dies. Okay, now I'm going to ask you this question. Evil or good, what would you call him? Evil. Evil, okay. Now I would like you to go to the next one, verse 9. In the 20th reign of, of Jeroboam, king of Israel, Asa became king of Judah. And his reign in Jerusalem 49 years, his grandmother, etc., What's it say in verse 11? Asa did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, as his father David had done. What, is, what will you say about him now? 
a, a good man or an evil man? A good man. Okay. And then what is the end story about him? He dies. Okay. Are you with me? I want you to jump over to Genesis. And I want you to go to Genesis chapter 5. It's called the Beget chapter. Especially if you were reading from the King James, Old King James will be called the Begats. Adam Beget Seth. <laughs> well, do you, you understand? But it's actually the genealogies. Okay, you with me? Now I want you to read with me verse 3. When Adam had lived 130 years, he had a son in his own likeness. Now I want you just to listen. You're going to have to explain to me who they are. Uh, um, what he, he is. After Seth was born, Adam lived 800 years. So all in all, Adam lived 930 years. And then he what? He died. You hear that? Okay, I want you to go down to Methuselah, verse 21. Sorry, question first. Good man or bad man? Adam. Good man or bad man? Good man. Okay, he made some bad mistakes, but he was a good man. He was a saved man. Okay. Now let's get down to um, Enoch, verse 21. When Enoch had lived 65 years, he became the father of who? Now can I ask any of you, who was the oldest man who ever died? Methuselah. Do you know that his name means, when I die, judgment comes? Okay, interesting. But let's get on. I want you to read verse 25. When Methuselah had lived 187 years, he became the father of Lamech. And after he became the father of um, Lamech, Methuselah lived 782 years and had other sons and daughters. Although altogether Methuselah lived how many years? 969 years and he died. Question, good man or bad man? Okay, but what happened to him? He died. Okay, I want you now to go over with me back to Ecclesiastes chapter 9. There is somehow this concept amongst God's people that you will be excluded from the affairs of planet Earth. That somehow God is going to keep you from and although you see 1,000 fall at your left and 10,000 at your right, not a hair on your head will be harmed. And then when things do go wrong, we start asking ourselves the question, where is God in this picture? What's going wrong? Now, dear friends, so many times we pray a prayer and the question that I want to ask is, is it, and I'm going to ask you this question to have it answered in, is it a valid prayer request? Okay. Many times we pray to God if somebody is sick or ill or got cancer or something, and we pray and we, we expect God to intervene and to save that person, but somehow God doesn't step forward and he doesn't save the person and the person dies. And then we all wonder if it's because our faith, didn't we have enough faith as a people who were asking God, because you know the faith of a righteous man availeth much. And somehow we start questioning that we didn't even have the faith of a mustard seed. And yet we are counseled that if we go to God and we ask him anything in Jesus' name, he will answer. It. Isn't that true? And we start looking at all of this and we start thinking, okay, then the error is not with us because we were faithful, we did believe God, we claimed the promise, so it has to be the person that we were praying for, that that person didn't have enough faith, and as a result, he died. And all of a sudden, our whole prayer requests become a way in which we determine the verdict of people, if they are saved or unsaved. And I, as a minister of the gospel, have found many times that I found myself in situations where people are dying. And uh, they expect me to pull out some kind of magical intervention with God where I can supersede everything that's attacking them. And, you know, the Bible says, though, we're going to come up against principalities and powers, but if we dress in the arm of God, we will overcome them. Christ says, I've given you power to stand on serpents and to crush scorpions, and we have all of this, and we claim it in the name of Jesus, and we find out he doesn't answer. 
And then we start looking to see who was to blame for this answer, this prayer not being answered. And dear friends, it happens in our church. I get it frequently. Why has God deserted me? Why doesn't he hear my prayers? My prayer seems to hit the ceiling. Dear friends, and what happens normally is that you become discouraged in praying because your prayers aren't answered. Why? You think they're not answered. But the reason why you think they're not answered is because they're not answered in the manner that you expected it to be answered. And you know the beautiful thing about God's word is that every promise is a yes in God's word. Did you hear me? Not once is it a no. When you go to God and you're asking him for healing, I want you to understand he has heard you and it's yes. Now I'm not asking you to exercise some kind of faith thing here. No, I'm asking you to believe the word. And if it is yes, and if you really believe with me that it's yes, and the person dies, was it still a yes? yes. You see, you immediately you all become a little silent. You were quite adamant, yes, you know, God's promise is yes, but when it doesn't go your way, mm -hmm, maybe it's not. And have you questioned yourself? Have you found yourself wondering before God, can I really ask you this? Have you wondered, listen, Lord, you know, um, this is not really a big matter, but, you know, I would really like you to help me to find parking. Have, haven't you done that? And then you do find parking, and what's the exciting thing about it? Thank you, God, for helping me to find parking. Isn't that true? But then you don't find parking. Lord, what's wrong? Don't you see a parking somewhere? Maybe he didn't want you to find parking there. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? I, pr I want you to never stop praying. The Bible says pray continuously in every matter. I find it embarrassing sometimes when I'm in the bathroom. And I also am talking to God, but I'm also sitting on the toilet. And I, re I say, oops, God, sorry. Um, I'll talk to you again a little later. Did God not know where I was? And I'm not trying to say that that's the right place, but do you find yourself kind of, oopsie, um, imagine you died there. Imagine you died there. But you said, God, don't worry, I'll talk to you a little later. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? David says, can I go into hell and you're not there? Now the hell that he's talking about, what is that? Dear friends, I want you to look at it. We, we say it's death, but hell is a place that we call bad times. Haven't you ever said that? Earth is like hell. I mean, I've never been to hell, but if earth is like hell, I don't want to go there. Well, there are some good places on hell then, because I like walking in nature and it's good there. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? The point that I'm trying to bring out, where can you go that God is not found? And where can you go that God cannot hear your prayer? You see, and I want you to understand that you need to pray all the time without ceasing. Praise Him, cry, moan, do everything but communicate with Him. I mean, I'm married and our conversation isn't always just, hello, how are you today? No, we have moments where the, where the swords are out. But you know what's happening? There is a form of communication taking place. It's trying to see who's the strongest in the room here. Do you understand? And man, I want to tell you the moments that I find the hardest in our experience is when we're not talking to one another. I'd rather have my wife hit me than not talk to me. Do you understand? I always think of God's word. If God should turn his face away from us, how frightening must that be? I remember reading in Ellen White's writings of an incident where she said that she, had, she was in heaven and she had saw Christ, but as she approached him, he turned his back on her. And she said it felt like that there was, th th this, this was terrible, it was the worst thing that could ever happen. And she turned to the, the guardian angel who was guiding her and said, what's wrong? Why did he turn his back on me? 
And it goes on to say, God asked you to do something, but you didn't do it. Now, dear friends, I want you to, to imagine this. I don't mind if you turn your backs on me, but I do mind if God turns his back on me. And what I'm trying to say to you today, that we need to get our mindset right. God refers to you as the apple of his eye. Who do, you, who do you call the apple of your eye? You call that kind of person who's a close person to you. I'm not talking about the apple that's the same from the tree. No, that's a different story. I'm talking about the apple of God's eye. It's one of the most beautiful words used to express an emotion regarding another person. It's almost like all God has eyes for is you. It's like when my wife walks into the church, our eyes will meet and she knows I saw her. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? God loves you and knows where you stay. He actually knows your name. And he is interested, even if you want to scream, if you want to throw things around the room, if you want to break things, if you want to just sulk, if you want to, whatever you want to do, he doesn't mind it as long as you're doing it in his presence. He's quite capable of handling our tantrums. But the beauty of it all he has your well-being in view in everything he does with you. That is something we can't save one another. We normally have our own well-being in view in our dealings with one another. But I want you to look with me Ecclesiastes chapter 9 again. It says there, and Solomon is sharing... You know, Ecclesiastes, I always say, is a book you must not read if you are depressed. Because if you were thinking about slitting your, rip, your wrists, you will, after you read Ecclesiastes. Because listen to the way he starts off. Keep your finger in line. But listen to the way he starts off in verse 2 of Ecclesiastes chapter 1. Verse 2 says... Meaningless, <laughs> meaningless, says the te teacher, utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. How do you like that for an introduction to the, the life philosophy or the philosophy of life? My son, I'd like you to sit down. I've got some news for you. Everything is meaningless. Utterly mon meaningless. Um, <laughs> you know, meaningless, meaningless, meaning. I mean, it's like... Okay, what should I live for? It's meaningless. I should I give me? It's meaningless. Should I do? It's meaningless. Everything is meaningless. And yet we've made things that are meaningless, not meaningless, meaningless. We worry about money and we chase after it and we do all kinds of things and then you die. What happened to your money? Did your money save you? We take things that are meaningless and we make them meaningful. Whereas according to God, it's meaningless. Even your body, even though we are counseled to care your body, after your body, everything. I want you to notice what it says in, in Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Okay, I've just told you that the, you can be a good person and you can be a bad person. The bad news, it's still meaningless. You're going to die. Some people eat properly. Some people live a godly life in order for what? That they will live longer and live healthier. And then all of a sudden something happens to them and then they wonder why. Welcome to meaningless planet Earth. People start off in businesses. They do well and all of a sudden coronavirus comes. Welcome to a planet in rebellion. 
Do you hear me? It's time for you to take your minds out of the clouds and find out that you actually got feet on planet Earth. And, you know, one person was telling me that they were in an excruciating pain. I said, isn't that good news? And they said, no, it's bad. I, I, I was suffering through I said, no, it's good news. She said, but how can you say it's good news? I said, because that's the way your body's telling you something's wrong. I mean, if, you know what leprosy is? Leprosy is when the nerves fail to communicate with your brain that something's happened. And you can put your hand in the fire and talk and everything like that, but because there is no communication via your nerve system, it'll burn there and you'll be talking, hey, did you hear that joke? Ha, in the meantime, it's burning. You know, I'm, I'm saying this, but it makes me think of two lepers that were playing cards. The one threw his hand in and the other one laughed his head off. The point I'm trying to make here is when you got a pain, praise God because somehow, I mean, Sean, have you ever kicked your toe? I'm not talking the big one. You can handle quite a lot of pain, eh? The small one. You kick it. How do you feel about it? And does your toe tell you straight away? It really, you know, I've watched children, little kids, they fall. And then you see them open their mouths, but there is no sound for a while. Nothing. <laughs> but what are you aware of? Sound is coming as soon as they get their breath. Because what did they just experience? Pain. Usually when they, you know that that was excruciating pain. If it's, <laughs> you know that's put on pain. When it's a pain where they open their mouth, I've seen it, they knock themselves blue. They open up their mouths, no noise. But when the noise does come out, it is loud and clear. I hurt myself. How, does, how, do, how, do, how do they know? You know, parents tell me that, that sometimes they had this experience that their child's one, one and a half, but the child is just kind of no communication. How does a parent feel? Something's wrong. You know, something, something must be wrong because this is not normal. Our children should start walking by now. Oh, well, they should start wanting to talk. And we have all of these norms set, and it's true. It's not normal. Dear friends, if you haven't got pain, <laughs> I think you need to pinch yourself a little bit to find out if you're real, if you're still around. You see, one of the ways in which God reminds us that we are living in a painful world is the pain, and it's a reminder to us, just as the rainbow was a reminder that there will never be a worldwide flood. Pain is a reminder to us that Adam and Eve made a very big mistake and that we need to be careful that we don't make the same mistake. Are you hearing me? You see, listen to this, Ecclesiastes chapter 3 Ecclesiastes, I said 5, but Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 18. I also thought, as for men, God tests them, so that they may see that they are like the animals. <laughs> What's yours say, Ethel? Does it say that? Yeah, verse 18. I said in mine heart concerning the estate of the sons of men, that God might manifest them, and that they might see that they themselves are beasts. So you see this evolution concept about coming from a, being a family with monkeys, it may not really the point here. But dear friends, we somehow tend to think that we are special in creation. No, it's true. You were created to be the caretakers of creation. But you were made from the same dust that they were made from. Because listen to what Solomon says. He says there, as one dies, oh well, let me read the whole thing so we're not. 
As for men, God tests them so that they may see that they are, that they are like the animals. Man's fate is like that of the animals. Listen to this, dear friends. Your fate is like that of the animals. The same fate awaits them both, good or evil. It says there, as one dies, so dies the other. We somehow have this impression that if we eat special, we will not. You know, I've never seen a little springbok eating meat. Have you, any of you ever noticed a springbok eating meat? Okay, so we can understand that the springbok should never die. Isn't that true? Because we say that if you eat meat, you die. Okay, but the lion's eating meat, okay, but he's dying, isn't he? But you know, I've got bad news. Who's eating the buck? The lion. What is the fate of both of them? They're going to both be eaten. The one, the strong might eat the little buck because he's the weak. But when that lion dies, the worms eat him. Do you know that they've said that in a animal, a lion's makeup, in its fur and that, there's an incredible amount of diseases or maggots and, not maggots, bugs and things that are in their fur and basically there to keep them clean. <laughs> but yet, if they go wrong, it can kill them. See, what I'm trying to explain to you here, dear friends, the only reason why you're different to the animals is because God said, I'm giving you the free will. But otherwise, bad news, you're going to die. Is there anybody in this room that thinks they're not going to die? Okay, so you've come to an understanding. You can be good, we just found out good people die. You can be bad, we've just found out bad people die. It's a common destiny to all. I go and visit people. When I get to them, and I'm, let me use an example, it's a person that is elderly. And they were just walking out of their house and they fell to the ground and they broke the hip. You walk up to that person and the first question they ask, but why did that happen to me? Welcome to planet Earth. They want to find reason, but why didn't God keep his hand on me? Did God not keep his hand on them? You know, what does God give you every day that you need every day? Breath. So you might have a breath that when you hit the ground, you can call out to God for help. But if you did not have breath, your body means nothing. They can actually jump on it and you won't know anything. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? I want you to recognize something about this meaningless life that you have. The bad news, you can live the best way you want to. You are going to die. Dear friends, there's a lot of uh, points here, and I, I can bring them out. You know, the, Solomon talks about a net being cast. Now, when you cast a net, I've watched the fishermen as they go out here in the false bay, and they cast that net, and they pull the fish in. What fish are in the net? Only good fish? All kinds of fish. You see, a net can't be cast out just for the good fish. And the interesting thing is you are on planet Earth and a net has been cast over planet Earth. And sadly, even though you're a good person, the net is death is going to come upon all man for all man have died. Oh, uh, because of Adam, some all man will die. Now, the question I have is not that you neglect the life that you have. I believe very much, and I'm that kind of person, that believes I want to have a quality of life which is in my hands to do. And that's why we talk about lifestyle things that you do, such as exercise, drinking water, 
breathing, etc. Those are things that you do to maintain lifestyle. But I can maintain my lifestyle to the best of my ability. I can go and train in a gym. I can eat all the correct foods. I can even go and get um, organic foods. I can go to the full extreme if I've got the money to be able to afford that stuff and eat it. I will just die looking pretty or handsome, but I'm going to still die. Do you understand? And so many of us spend our money on trying not to die. And I know of beautiful people that come to a stage in their life, young and old. I knew a minister, he was a dynamic minister. It was almost people wept when he died. But he got cancer one day and within a short period of time was gone. And a lot of people were wondering why. The common destiny of all men, animals, people, good, bad, you die. When I go and visit frail people, I don't, you know, and they say to me, please, Vili, my hip's broken. <laughs> Can you please pray that my hip will be all right? I'm going to ask you now, what kind of prayer should I pray now? Come on, that person's hip's broken. Lord, please give that person a new hip. What kind of hip must I ask them to give? An old person's hip or a young person's hip? Which one should I ask now? Do you understand my, what I'm asking you, dear friends? We sometimes are expecting God to do something with our bodies that are dying and we want Him to give us eternal youth. And we go and we run and we grab everything to try and keep it. The oil of delay. Trying to keep the wrinkles away. It's, I know it's the oil of delay, but it's the oil of delay. <laughs> Do you understand? People think that by doing something, they can inevitably put death away. You know, the Bible says you run from the lion or the bear, which is death. You run from it and you lean against the wall because you're tired from running from death and then a snake bites you here. And you die. You, di you didn't die from the bear, you died from the snake. But what's inevitable? You die. You know, one of the things I've always said to God, please, I, I heard of a, one of my fam members was a very devout person that he, he prayed every night before he went to sleep. He prayed during the day. But he would go into his room, close his door, and he would go on his knees next to his bed and he would pray. He, he, he was really committed to prayer. But one day he said to the people, I'm going into prayer, and he was quite elderly. I'm going to go have a prayer. They said, okay, they knew that. And then he would close the door behind him. And, and supper time came, and they came and they knocked on the door. Oh, boss, the food is ready. Didn't want to interfere because he's on his knees praying. Nothing happened. Thought, deep in prayer today. Came back. Oh, boss, time for you to come and eat. No reaction. When they opened the door, they found him dead on his knees, praying. And I've always said to God, if you could take me, take me when I'm on my knees. I don't want to be taken out by a bus. At least, if it is, I don't want to know the bus hit me. It must be a surprise. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm trying to say? But one thing you need to understand, dear friends, you are on planet Earth. And if there's anybody that knows that, Jesus knows that. And if you want a sympathetic ear to pray to, that's the best ear to talk to. Because he was on planet Earth and in all points was challenged as you are. 
but even in greater measure. In my life I've fasted various times, but I've never managed to fast for 40 days and 40 nights. And that's total abstinence. I could not do that. And then I thought to myself, how is it possible that Christ did that? And if that is any measurement of how bad and how challenged our world is, that he had to fast for 40 days and 40 nights to prepare for challenge. What an incredible burden he was carrying. Because he was carrying the burdens of all your sins. You don't even have to pray that long or fast that long anymore because he's done it for you. So what I want you to understand, there are going to be things that are going to happen you, to you in your life. And dear friends, some of them we bring on ourselves. We make wrong choices and you break the law you have to bear the consequences. I think always of Oscar Pistorius. You know that bloke that ran without legs? Oscar, isn't it? Oscar. One evening, only God knows what really happened in that room. He shot his fiance. As much as he can regret it, and as much as he can ask for forgiveness, he has to bear the consequences of that action. Adam and Eve chose to eat from the tree. God said, the day you eat of the tree, you shall surely die. And the sad part is he didn't know it, but the rest of us were part of that um, pool group. So what I'm trying to say to you, when I think again of God's people in the Word, I read of David that was so cold that they even had to give him a young lady to keep him warm. Now, that's what they did in those days. Nowadays we have electric blankets. The point that I'm trying to bring out here <laughs> is that when you look at that, they suffered. Some of them suffered terribly. You know, dear friends, this Passion of the Christ, have any of you ever seen it? It's really terrible when you look at it. You can't believe it's possible. But Kaiki was just telling me how that she read about parents who were cooking their children and eating them. You know, and the thought that comes to my mind, you think of Christ. You know, we, they, we, we always have him on the cross fully, well, not fully clothed, but at least clothed decently. It wasn't the case. You see, somehow we want to be blind to reality. But there's no blindness here. And it's time for you to be aware of the fact that you need ourselves so that you can see, that you can see your true state, so that you can go on your knees and ask for forgiveness. You need now not to ask God for prayer requests where you ask him for the, not the impossible, he can do it, but where you asking him to do something for you just because you don't want to get old or just because you don't want to have any pain. When I was having radiation treatment, I watched little kids Children, I, my guesstimate is, how old is Lindy, the little one there with you? How old? Three. About three years of age. Running around, no hair, all gone. Chemo, radiation. And yet they were running around, laughing. Old people like me, oh, <laughs> oh, yeah. We are like carrying the burdens of the world. I want to end off. Go with me to Ecclesiastes chapter 9. I think it's there. In Ecclesiastes chapter 9, we've just read the same destiny, verse 3. 
overtakes all. The same destiny overtakes all. The interesting thing is, listen to verse 5, please, dear friends. Verse 5 says, For the living know what? Dear friends, you are going to die. I mean, I'm, I'm hoping in a lovely way, but you are going to die. Somehow, don't think you're not. The question is, how have you enjoyed today? Do you walk around, oh, I'm going to die. Oh, I'm going to die. You know, it's true. Then you, <laughs> it's terrible to live on planet Earth because you're going to die. But listen to this. Okay, we're finishing off. I want you to read verse 7 with me. Go eat your food with gladness. How many of you are so worried about what you're eating? Go eat your food with gladness and drink your wine with a joyful heart. For it is now that God favors what you do. Always be clothed in white. That means... Purity, first of all, always make sure your actions are right, but it also means brightness. You know, once a little child was asked to draw a picture of a Christian, and she draw, drew the face of a cow. And they asked her, but why? She says, because that's what they look like. Now, dear friends, how many of you are giving that kind of impression to the world? That to be Christian is one of the hardest things to ever do on planet Earth. Always be clothed in white and always anoint your head with oil. Do you hear that? You know, David didn't anoint his head with oil while he was fasting. And usually fasting is a kind of way in which you're indicating death. So when you're dead, you, man, they can pour oil on you, it doesn't benefit you. Pour oil on your head now while you're living. Enjoy life with your wife whom you love all the days of your meaningless life. <laughs> As if <laughs> I have a wife but it's meaningless. I mean, sometimes it's like... <laughs> uh, all the days of this meaningless life that God has given you under the sun. All your meaningless days. Now, dear friends, what I'm trying to say to you today... The difference between us, Christian, and everybody else is that we should be praising God every moment of our lives. There should be a song in your heart every day. There should never be a time you can take your burdens to him. You can ask him to help you to handle pain. He does it. The one person that was asking me, you know, I was praying to God, please, he must help me with the pain. So I asked the question, has he? Oh, no, I still feel the pain. So I said, but has he answered your prayer? And the person finally said, but I don't know. I still feel incredible pain. <laughs> now, obviously, it sounds like it's not. But this person's going for an operation. God willing that Dr. Mabaza, who is a specialist in his field, will do exactly what has to be done, and pain will be gone. Then I said to the person, I want you to be a missionary there. I want you to wear white. I want you to go in there, and although you're in extreme pain, I want you to turn to him and say, you know, God has put me here so that I can pray for you. And I want you to allow me. And this person has agreed that they are going to ask the surgeon, before they did, if they could have a prayer with him. Now I'm going to ask you this question. The surgeon is going to help this person to feel better. But what has this person who's feeling the pain done for the surgeon? Do you hear the difference? The one has improved life here, the other one has given life eternal. Which one's more important? So dear friends, what I'm trying to say to you, welcome to planet Earth. It's not nice here. Yeah? 
but yet we have a loving companion who knows everything you're going through. And his main goal is not to alleviate your problems here. His main goal is to prepare you for heaven. Did you hear me? His main goal is to prepare you for heaven. Not to answer all your little things. His main purpose, if you should say to the Lord, Lord save me, he will. May God bless you.